Welcome to A House Divided. I'm Daniel Weinberg, and we're sitting in the broadcast studio here at the Abraham Lincoln Bookshop in Chicago, and we welcome you back to A House Divided. Now, we don't want you to miss any future broadcasts, so do subscribe to A House Divided on our website, alincolnbookshop.com. It's free, and we'd love to have you see our future uh, broadcasts as well. You're live on Facebook page, so uh, don't forget to comment or even ask a question if you'd like. We'll try to get to it. We're a little truncated today, so we'll try to get to them. If we don't, afterwards we'll try to see what we can do to answer. You can purchase a signed book now, and you'll see a link uh, on the comments section very soon, if not now. And if you're watching after the broadcast on our site or on YouTube, uh, you certainly can ask for a signed book again. We'll probably have signed first editions left, at least signed copies. First editions may go. I bet this is a popular book. Well, this is our first broadcast since the pandemic here live in our broadcast studio. So we're very happy to welcome you, Steve, uh, to uh, the first live broadcast. I'm thrilled to be here. I'm sorry to have been late, but grateful not to be quite as late. They as don't know it. Muhammad, a, uh, a taxi driver who brought me here through a bunch of alleys through traffic. So Good glad to be here now. Muhammad. Glad to be here now. So Stephen Inskeep is the co-host of the National Public Radio's Morning Edition and also of Up First. He is an author of numbers of books the Imperfect Union, How Jesse and John Fremont Mapped the West, Invented Celebrity, and Helped Cause the Civil War. Jackson Land, President Andrew Jackson, Cherokee Chief John Ross, and a Great American Land Grab. Also, Instant City, The Life and Death in Karachi. His latest book, Differ We Must. How Lincoln Succeeded in a Divided America. It's a Penguin Press, 331 pages illustrated, and $30. Tell us, Steve, about the title of this book. Uh, I know it's a relationship to his Kentucky friend, yeah. uh, who must have been, Lincoln must have been vexed that his good friend was a slave owner, but he certainly turned him around a bit uh, before the 1964, uh, 1864, uh, convention and nomination. Yeah, absolutely. Also before the 1964, right? so you weren't yes. wrong. Uh, yeah, Joshua Speed was Lincoln's best friend of his life, or arguably so. And Speed did come from a slaveholding family in Kentucky. He grew up on this farm where dozens of enslaved laborers worked. Um, as an adult, he moved to the free state of Illinois. He told Lincoln that he was opposed to slavery in the abstract, but Lincoln wrote him a letter in which he said, you're not really serious politically about doing anything about it. Your politics are wrong. And he even went on to say a lot of slaveholders feel that way. They will say slavery is evil, but they don't do anything about it. But he then went on to say, if for this you and I must differ, differ we must. And rather than ostracizing his friend who had the wrong view, he kept working on him. He even signed the letter, Your Friend Forever. And you're exactly correct. When the Civil War came, Joshua Speed, his best friend, was on Lincoln's side, the Union side, the, uh, the right side, I think we can comfortably say. And Speed helped to keep his state of Kentucky in the Union. And I think that that is emblematic of the work that Lincoln tries to do throughout this book. I try to tell his life story through 16 meetings he had with people who disagreed with him or differed with him in some way. In some way. And it's a fascinating way to do this. And I'm surprised Thanks. it took that long for someone to think about this. There are 16 uh, characters that are, have come out. Some are known, some are not. And you have to each one of them some sort of a label either provocateur or extremist or nativist. Uh, first lady, we have Mary in here, editor, sovereign, activist, soldier. Each of them have one of these, these funnels that they're in. So each of these, of course, were face-to-face -face meetings at some point or another. Yeah. And uh, it's in action with other people, as you write. And each wanted something from Lincoln. So each showed some aspect 
of Lincoln in opposition to someone who is somewhat in opposition to him. Is this the essence of the book? And how did you come to this? Um, I started thinking about the diversity of America, which is something I think about a lot because of the news that I cover and what a diverse country it is. And I was thinking about how diverse America was back then, even though white men got nearly all the attention and had 99.9% .9 of the power. Uh, there was every kind of person. And there was every class of person and background of person. And I thought that if I told Lincoln's story through his meetings with different people, I would get across not only different aspects of Abraham Lincoln, but different aspects of America. Um, and what I gradually realized was that it wasn't just the difference that was important, it was the disagreement. That's what is relevant to now, when many of us feel like the country is so badly divided. Well, this is a time when it was very badly divided, and Lincoln had to struggle not just with one divide, but with many different kinds of divisions. And he wasn't always going to change people's minds, but he had to figure out how to relate to them or what to do with them. Let me ask you something basic. You're a journalist. But you also, that's during, that's your day job. Yeah. But you go home at night, lock yourself in the closet, and you become <laughs> an historian and write, write, write. So it's interesting that there are a number of journalists who are now stepping into our realm. Mm -hmm. um, John Avlon is one. Julian Scherer, mm -hmm. Ed Acorn, all are journalists who write very well, just as you do. Oh, well, thank you. Because you're journalists, maybe. And, uh, but you are now historians as well. Does a background in journalism help you write as an historian oh, or even research? Absolutely, absolutely. There's even another journalist I can think of, my friend John Meacham, who I believe has been on this very webcast at he some has. point. Uh, another uh, ongoing, I guess he's more of a historian these days than a journalist, but he's done both brilliantly. Um, and I think it does help. One of the things that it helps is my journalism makes me think about history maybe in a different way than if I had a different background. And my history research also affects my journalism. I try to take the long view of things. There are a lot of stories that are the latest breaking news that honestly don't interest me. I don't feel like they're necessarily the most important thing going on. And I try to think about things that have larger and longer term effects. Um, and. You're not talking about Taylor Swift, are you? Oh, well, no. Well, actually, we had Taylor Swift on NPR the other day. Did Some really? people were upset. Taylor well, Swift is fine. Taylor Swift is a long-running cultural phenomenon. Yes, she is. There's an album called 1989. But in any case, uh, I mean, she, she's totally great. But in any case, um, I'm trying to think about the longer term. And in covering politics or covering any number of different kinds of stories today, you get insights into people's concerns and how politics works and insights into human nature. Mm -hmm. And you try to project those back. I mean, you have to be careful about that, as I'm sure you know very well. You don't want to pretend the past is the present and get them mixed up too much. But human nature doesn't change all that much. No. And we're still in the same country, and it's still got the same very basic form of government. And so a lot of the lessons do pass back and forth. What was the process of picking both the different funnels that I talked about, activist, editor, yeah. et cetera, versus the characters themselves? Which came first? Did you pick those, those uh, funnels and then find someone uh, the uh, other way around? That, the way you said the first time would be really systematic and intelligent, and that is not the way that I did it at all. Um, I did it in a much more random way, hmm. which is the way that I end up doing a lot of my research. And maybe that is informed by my journalism. We had a great international editor uh, many years ago who said to me that really all the, the best way to find a story when you're coming to a new country, because he was traveling around the world, is just get in there and thrash around. Mm. Try to find what you can find. And that's how I end up researching. I was interested in telling Lincoln's story through a series of meetings. I have been obsessed with Lincoln all my life, and so I knew of some. I knew, for example, of the famous story of his wrestling match with Jack Armstrong, who later became a political supporter. I thought for a while he might be one of the 16. He ended up not being because I kept going in and researching and discovering new characters that I thought said more meaningful things. And each time I would find a new character, I would get excited and start writing. 
and then I'd get stuck, and that was when I knew I hadn't researched enough yet. So I'd be going back to Library of Congress files or writing off to different historical societies or going to Springfield, Illinois, and trying to find new facts and new information that would drive me further into the book. Did many go by the wayside? Oh, yeah, there's, a, I think, three or four chapters that I cut out at yeah. the end. No. Um, there is and a you chapter. put them on the web I, I could, now. I could, I could, I could, could publish the chapter on James Shields, with whom he almost that had a That would be a, duel, a wonderful one. You know, on the web. I could do, I will do that. Thanks yeah, for the suggestion. That would be enjoyable. Now, did Lincoln, you know, he had a willingness, as you're saying, to uh, have difficult conversations. Yeah. Did he seek those opponents out? Uh, or did they in, just come? In some ways, he did seek them out. In some ways, they, in some occasions, they came to him. But uh, I think of uh, somebody like, uh, well, like Stephen A. Douglas, for example, is a rival that he chased around famously yeah. for many years. And I include Douglas among the 16 because it seems clear to me that Lincoln's reasoning and line of rhetoric evolved because of his competition with Stephen A. Douglas. Douglas, as viewers of this uh, event surely know very well, um, did not claim to be pro-slavery, but sponsored the Kansas-Nebraska Act, which would have allowed the spread of slavery into the West, and ended up not only in the Lincoln-Douglas debates of 1858, but several years earlier, repeatedly being on the same stage with Lincoln, because Lincoln would follow him around and speak yeah. after him, and sometimes Douglas would reply. And in 1854, Douglas was using an argument about equality for this pro-slavery bill, essentially saying, shouldn't any white man from any state in the Union be allowed to bring his property west to Kansas to settle, whether he's in a free state or a slave state. He was literally talking about equality as a pro-slavery idea, and that forced Lincoln to respond. And as far as I can tell from my research, the earliest time that Lincoln struck back rhetorically with the Declaration of Independence was in a speech responding to Douglas in 1854. He cited the Declaration of Independence line that all men are created equal, which is a thing that abolitionists had done for decades, but Lincoln himself had not picked up. The competition with Douglas forced him to do that. Um, and we could go through a variety of these stories of people who we were shall. his friends and were different, people who were his opponents and he tried to come to some accommodation with, or somebody like Stephen A. Douglas that he just tried to beat. We'll get to some of them in a few moments. Right. Uh, as a lawyer, he agreed, his technique in the, as a lawyer was to agree with everything that he could with the opposition, and then there was a colonel that he kept to himself, and then he finally put out to win the argument. So he had recurrent political processes and techniques, I presume, yeah. and skills um, with dealing with opposing people and maybe even those who are less opposing. Um, what do you think were recurring throughout these? Are there any skills that you'll yeah. see throughout these? I know I'll say this, that Ward Lamon, who is not in here, mm -hmm. uh, but was a supporter, of course, yeah. he said of Lincoln that he could stretch the truth when necessary. <laughs> so were there skills that he used throughout these 16 chapters? Yes, absolutely. And there's one related to what you just said. It's rare to find an occasion where Lincoln lies. It's common to find an occasion where Lincoln does not tell the whole truth. Even today, after all the thousands and thousands of books about Lincoln, he's something of a mysterious character oh, yes. because of how carefully he spoke. Even to and, his friends. Yes, and even to his friends. And he had another friend, uh, there's a quote in the book here, who said that Lincoln, in conversation, would seem to be so candid and forthcoming as to give a visitor the impression that he had disclosed everything, when in reality he had spoken so carefully as to disclose nothing. Do you think this is deception? Um, deception seems like a bit of a strong word, but it's a thing that he did. I thought so, but I thought did. I'd give it. Yeah, that's fine. But, it, but it's a thing that he did um, to try to keep the focus, essentially do the same thing that you just described as a lawyer. Mm -hmm. He was trying to put things aside that were extraneous and focus on the one essential thing. So he'd talk about the one essential thing and fall silent about all the other stuff. So it's really kind of a fuzziness, as you say. Yeah, yeah, although the one essential thing he would not be fuzzy about. It's fascinating that on slavery, before the Civil War, 
His position was quite nuanced. He wasn't an abolitionist. He wanted to restrict slavery because he felt that it would be politically and legally impossible to do more. Um, but the one thing that he wouldn't give away, the point that he wouldn't concede, was that slavery was wrong. And that ultimately that one point that the system was wrong, that the system was unjust, that the system someday somehow should be destroyed even if he didn't know how, that ultimately made him a radical even though he didn't seem like it at the time. And the extension of that, to me, is the most important thing that he did, I, I think, is that he didn't allow his own Republican Party or anyone else to get him off the idea of no extension of slavery. Yeah. Period. Yeah. Because that would be giving away the store. Uh, and so that's really what I think was the most radical thing that he really did. He was the first president to say, no, we're not going to have it. Yeah. No and, matter what. And, and that is pertinent to one of my 16 meetings mm -hmm. with a man named Duff Green, yep. who was a friend of his and a distant relation by marriage, who went and met Abraham Lincoln in December of 1860. So Lincoln has been elected. It's the transition. He hasn't been inaugurated. And southern states are beginning to secede, and more of them are coming, claiming they're no longer part of the Union. And Duff Green comes to meet Lincoln and says, why don't you go along with this compromise? that would enshrine slavery in the Constitution forever uh, in the states that care to practice it, and also would have some tweaks and changes regarding extension of slavery in the West. And Lincoln was willing to talk about that, was willing to write a letter on the topic, but ultimately was not going to go along with it, and his party wasn't going to go along well, that with it. That was an interesting tactic that he used, and he used it with others, even Judge Campbell, who makes a, uh, a yes. chapter in yeah. here, that he did write a letter, but not send it. Yeah. And in fact, he gave it to people ra more radical than he yeah. to keep until they exactly. met Exactly, exactly. I mean, we don't know every detail, but it seems like Duff Green in an hours and hours meeting said, can you just write me something? And Lincoln's like, yeah, I'll write you something. And the letter wouldn't have been that helpful to Duff Green anyway, but even so, he sent it in a way that Green would never get it. You say that there are some encounters uh, and their consequences that were surprising to yeah. you. Uh, which ones and how? And did it change your viewpoint of Lincoln? You must have had some yeah. viewpoint before you entered the, uh, yeah. the book. Yeah. Um, I, I want to summarize the way that my viewpoint changed using the words of a friend of mine, Noel King, uh, who's, a, who's a great podcaster for Vox and a former colleague of mine at NPR. Um, she said before, she read some early chapters of this book, and she said before reading them, I thought Lincoln succeeded because he was good. I now believe he succeeded because he was smart. And that gets to things that I feel I didn't understand even after all my you know, years of reading Lincoln. How did he think about people? What did he think about human nature? How did he try to motivate or even manipulate people? And I understood, came to understand, that Lincoln believed that people were primarily motivated by self-interest, which is a grim thought, but kind of true if you think about it. And really, it has to be. We have to look after our own interests as individuals and sometimes as communities. And he knew that in order to get people to do something that was right, that was moral, he also needed to appeal to their self-interest. And that became a key for me in understanding his politics, things that he was for, things that he was against, and also the arguments that he made in his speeches, why he argued against slavery in one way and not another way. It was telling white voters why slavery was also bad for them, in addition to being very, very bad for the people who were enslaved. That's right. And maybe the next person who's stronger than you might enslave you. Yes. But People are political animals. It's the only way we can survive in society. Yeah. So he, wa he rose above himself, as you say. He rose above politicians as we know it or see it. We don't really revere them too much, even though all of us are that. Uh, but we revere him because he was such a wonderful politician, which basically is to get things done. Yeah. yeah. That's what he did. Yeah, which is another thing that came clear to me, exactly as you said, that he was a politician, that that was his business. And we don't revere or respect that profession. Uh, and given the way that some people practice it, perhaps we shouldn't. Yeah, yesterday was a good example. But you are uh, exactly right 
that politics is really just trying to figure out how you're going to get along with your fellow citizens. Politics is the work of democracy. If we're in favor of democracy, we need to be in favor of politics and need to do it as well as we can manage. I think he got a leg up on his political uh, time in America, and that is because he he was raised after Kentucky and Indiana. Yeah. He was in central Illinois, which really is a border state. Mm -hmm. And so he saw as he was on circuit as a lawyer, his time uh, in central Illinois, he saw all stripes of political problems and people. And he had to deal with every single one of them. And he got to understand every single one of them so he could go forward in that way. How did being in a border state, oh, Central I, Illinois, help him? I think that, that, that that's, a, that's a great insight. There were settlers from different places in this, in this state. There was someone like Owen Lovejoy who was from Maine and was uh, labeled an abolitionist and was a radical anti-slavery guy. But there were also enormous numbers of settlers from Kentucky as he was and even farther south. And so he was surrounded by... Uh, men and women who had various slaveholding backgrounds, which doesn't sound like a particular benefit at all, except that he gained some understanding and some empathy for these people so that he could appeal to them to do something better than what they had done. Um, I want to draw a distinction if I can. There's a military man many years ago who said, for him, there's a difference between sympathy and empathy. Oh, yes. If he's thinking about the enemy, he doesn't want to sympathize with the enemy or believe in the enemy's cause, but he does want to empathize with the enemy. I want to understand what the other guy is doing so that I can fight him uh, more effectively. And Lincoln, of course, wasn't trying to fight his fellow citizens, but he needed to interact with and motivate and appeal to his fellow citizens and understanding how different kinds of people thought was extremely important. And that's another thing that I discovered in this book that changed my view of his youth growing up. From a very young age, he was reading books. That's a thing that the many of us learn when we're children about Abraham Lincoln, his miraculous almost uh, self-education. But I realized the books were not that numerous and probably not that great. And what was numerous and was very valuable and relevant was the people around him. He studied them as a child. His stepmother describes grown-ups coming to visit the cabin, and Lincoln would listen to everything they said, and then after the grown-ups left, he would ask a million questions about everything to understand it. Then he gets to Illinois, where you're talking about, and he's meeting every kind of person in New Salem, Illinois, whoever is coming through. Later, he's in Springfield and studying for the law, and whoever comes to the state capitol to transact business. He's, he's learning from them. And uh, by the time he's a state legislator, one of his fellow legislators describes his mind as a great storehouse of knowledge of what people do in their lives and their motivations, mm -hmm. which was the key, getting back to that question of people's interests and how could you engage them. In those times when he listened to the adults and then went to his corner and thought and thought and thought, he said he bounded north and south, bounded east and west, the arguments, so he could understand it, maybe even himself, uh, proffer it later on to others. Part of the empathy that he obtained, he said, came because, do you know that I was once a slave? Yeah. Now, I don't like that myself. Mm -hmm. I think he was... Um, Overstating? No, I think that he was not thinking of his father and those that he was helping. Every single boy and many women, girls, yeah. and out in the frontier, they had to go out, make money for the family. His father had 14 mouths to feed and clothe and shelter. So uh, I Should just... Should we explain to people he was sent, he was sent out, rented yes, out to right. other farms to yeah, work? Yeah, as many man. were of yeah. his time. So I just thought that he uh, looked at it a little differently. He should have... He should have said, yeah, this is what I need to do because others are doing it. But that's me. But, uh -huh. he, but if he felt he was a slave, he certainly had empathy for those he saw maybe going to New Orleans and shackled like so many yeah. fish together. Well, I, I, I love that you bring that up um, because I'm thinking of a quote by Frederick Douglass, who's another character in this book, who after Lincoln's death, reflecting on what became a friendship, even though Douglass was often critical of Lincoln, 
he said, I feel that perhaps Lincoln was connected to me because we had both begun at the bottom and mm. risen up. I think that's a really generous quote by Frederick Douglass, who had begun his life enslaved and so and an even worse position considerably than Abraham Lincoln as a as a poor kid on the frontier whose mother died when he was young. But they both had difficult upbringings, and I think that that both in both cases it informed their view of the world when they grew up. You had a novel idea in here that uh, I, that was new to me that uh, I'm still struggling with, okay. but I'd like to hear what you have to say, okay. and that's with Mary Lincoln okay. and his marriage. All right. And the idea is that the struggles, if he was unhappy in his marriage, as some think he was, maybe others don't, but mm -hmm. it was certainly a different sort of a marriage. He had maybe some difficulty in there. Yeah. I'm not sure he was so more, uh, much easier to be with I think than his wife. Point. Yeah. But nonetheless, that you say that he, the skills he needed at home to be with Mary and uh, resembled some he needed at work. So he, you're intimating a bit that it's not a bad thing that their marriage was unhappy because it helped him in his political work. I wonder how do you, how do you balance that with being on the circuit and what he learned there at the same time he had that marriage. First, I want to like do somersaults that I'm in the Lincoln bookshop and you're telling me you came across something new that I hadn't thought about before. So thank you very much. Um, <laughs> I don't feel that, that this I, idea of mine is a, is a hundred percent new. I feel that I have come across iterations mm. of this in my many, many years of Lincoln reading. So if someone is saying, I've read that one before, okay. uh, you're probably right. But I did feel it strongly and felt that, that, that my reporting, so to, so to speak, or my research bore it out. Um, I am not saying, well, maybe I am saying that, that the difficulty of his marriage was, was helpful in a way. Um, he uh, could be a difficult husband. He also had struggles with a, with a, a wife who had her own great difficulties, Di had, had terrible tragedy to wrestle with, did not necessarily do very well in that, demanded a lot of attention for herself, had difficulty controlling her impulses, her temper, her spending. We could go on and on. This is uh, well-known well -known facts about uh, Mary Todd Lincoln. Ooh, we're about to head to a different chapter here. But I'll just say, um, oh, absolutely. Um, but he needed a lot of patience, needed a lot of forbearance, and needed to decide what was most important to focus on and what to let go of. And when I think about the way that he managed General George McClellan, I find a lot of similarities. Again, there was a man who demanded a lot of attention, who was very difficult to deal with, who could be very temperamental, who insulted the president often, and Lincoln had to think about what was the more important thing and what to ignore. Well, that's why I was going to show this photograph, this artifact that I have. I hope people can see that. This is taken October 3rd of 1862 by Alexander Gardner at Antietam, and there's Lincoln uh, with his hand resting on a chair so he won't sway in the wind, which he did the first time they tried that, with McClellan. So I was wondering what you thought about that relationship, I and mean, you just brought it up. Yeah. It's a well-known and controversial relationship. Yeah. What, what do you think, how do you think he handled McClellan? Well, um, my favorite thing to learn about this, uh, and uh, again, I, th I think they're like the, the basic outlines of Lincoln's story are familiar to a lot of people, but it was in the details that I kept learning. And of course, I've read about McClellan since I was a kid, um, and how insubordinate McClellan was, how disrespectful McClellan was of Lincoln. But I didn't realize fully until I got into the story what happened at the end. Lincoln tolerated this disobedient general for more than a year. Finally, uh, his administration maneuvered McClellan out of power or maneuvered him away from his army. And then there was a crisis, and Lincoln alone, over the objections of his entire cabinet, made the choice to put McClellan back in command. And of course, McClellan won one more victory, or one victory, his major victory at Antietam. The incredible irony to me was that in addition to being a difficult person to deal with, and apparently a very insecure person, uh, particularly in a crisis situation, McClellan didn't really agree with Lincoln at all about slavery. Lincoln was on his way to the Emancipation Proclamation. McClellan was moving in the other direction, had seen 
people who escaped from slavery into the Union lines, and McClellan just applied every stereotype. They're lazy. They're not ready for emancipation. It was projection. Yeah, yeah, it could be. And and McClellan's like, well, in theory, it'd be nice to emancipate them, but not now. Definitely not during the war. Let's not interfere with what he called the relations of servitude. He had known Southern elites since his time at West Point, the military academy, and he seemed to have absorbed their attitudes. So McClellan didn't agree with emancipation, but Lincoln used him to get the one victory that set the stage for the Emancipation Proclamation. McClellan helped him to do that, even though it seems to me he never favored it, and in his memoir written after the war never mentioned it. No, well, I'm not sure, I'm not sure he may have felt himself, although he's an, he was an emperor type, maybe he did, that he did really win that battle. Uh -huh. Well, he kind of backed into it a little bit. Yeah. So uh, maybe he felt that he had backed into it a little bit. Yeah. Under the funnel of uh, dissident, you have George Pendleton. Now, there's yeah. a, now, the interesting thing, there are many people you know in this book, and there are some you're, you're, you know of, but not very well. And you're going to get to know them in this book, like Pendleton, you go a little bit deeper into him. Of course, he's uh, allied with here with Clement Vallandigham in the Constitution. They dominate that chapter. Uh, of course, Lincoln said of habeas corpus, are all the laws but one to go unexecuted, yeah. and the government itself go to pieces, lest that one be violated. I was just at a uh, Civil War show in Marietta, Georgia, a few months ago, a couple uh -huh. months ago. And a man made sure to come up to me, he saw Abraham Lincoln Bookshop, and to tell me, remind me that Lincoln was a tyrant. He didn't want to really talk about it. I wanted to, it was interesting. I wanted to go with him on that. Yeah. But he, he just said that and then walked away. I think if he was a tyrant, we're kind of lucky it was Lincoln, huh. not maybe McClellan even. Um, and Lincoln told of his incredulity that anyone would vote for, for landing him for uh, Ohio governor. You can see that today, too. I mean, it, so many of us on either side of this aisle uh, cannot believe that the other is voting for that yeah. person. Yeah. What are your thoughts? Was Lincoln a dictator or acting like oh, one? Well, this is, this is an awesome story that you bring up. And I want to mention, I've done uh, interviews on radio and TV about this book. And there was a call-in show where a woman called in. And she said Lincoln was evil um, and gave her reasons. Um, and this thing about suspending habeas corpus is pretty well done, pretty well known, but then there were a lot of details that I did not know. For those who were not aware, when the rebellion started, Lincoln ordered people arrested who were suspected of various kinds of treason or sabotage. He was ordered by the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, Roger Tawney, to release a Maryland man and ignored the order and said, you say it's unconstitutional. I'm doing my own interpretation of the Constitution. I have the power to do that in cases of rebellion. So there. And Lincoln had the army, and so Tawney lost that argument. Ultimately, Congress passed a law uh, that backed Lincoln up, that gave him the legal authority to have people arrested and held without trial uh, in, in, certain, in certain cases. And uh, the story of George H. Pendleton and of Clement Vallandigham, I didn't know in such detail, but Vallandigham was a politician who attacked the war in a speech and was arrested essentially for his words. And this was something that by then, Lincoln's administration had the undisputed legal right to do, but it was not right. And the people who understood it was not right included Lincoln, but his general on the scene had already made the arrest, and so they had to make the best of a bad situation. They felt that backing down and admitting the mistake would just encourage more nasty rhetoric. And so they sent the man away to the South, Philandingham to the South. They, they, rather than hold him, they said, well, you're a Confederate sympathizer. We're going to send you South. Philandingham got out of the Confederacy, went to Canada, and campaigned for governor of Ohio while in exile. It's a crazy story. And George H. Pendleton was the man, because this is a book about face-to-face -face meetings. The George H. Pendleton was the man who was an ally of the governor candidate in exile who went to Washington to demand that Lincoln drop his case against this guy. 
demand that Lincoln admit how wrong he'd been and let Vallandigham back into the United States, in effect. Um, and Lincoln didn't want to do it, even though he knew the guy on the other side of the desk had the proper constitutional argument, or at least the proper moral argument. They had the right to do it constitutionally, but it was not right to arrest someone just for their speech. And he ended up doing another one of these clever letters that we're talking about. This time it was delivered. And he said, I would be happy to release Vallandigham. No problem, be happy to release him. If only you guys will sign on to these conditions, that the war is legitimate, that it's okay to fund the troops and various other things. And uh, Pendleton and the rest of the delegation from Ohio refused those terms. They basically said the fact that you're even offering to release him shows that you know you're wrong. And ultimately, the decision came down to the people of the state of Ohio because Vallandigham, even though he'd been arrested and was held in custody and sent south, and made his way north, even though all of those things happened, he was still on the ballot for governor of Ohio. Yeah. And the people of Ohio defeated him. The South didn't want him either. No, South didn't want him. And uh, the people of Ohio didn't want him. He lost the election like 60-40. It was a landslide. But even so, as you observed at the beginning, Lincoln was sad that he ever got nominated and couldn't believe that anybody voted for him. Yeah. Um, I just want to ask you a kind of quick, brief question. Anything. We have here many artifacts, historical artifacts here in the shop. We're not just a bookshop. We have autographed letters and busts, as you can see behind me. This is incredible. And the thank you. And so here is actually a, uh, an electoral ticket. OK. And you say in here, it was interesting, that when he voted, he went and tore off his name. Yes and put the rest in the box, because everyone knew whom everyone voted for anyway. Yeah. But he tore off his name when he voted. Why? Uh, this is a beautiful story written by a newspaper correspondent who appeared to have walked around Springfield with him on election day of 1860, and uh, did go with Lincoln to vote, and watched as this happened. Lincoln basically seems to have voted in public. And yeah, he tore off his yeah. own name so that he would vote for the rest of the Republican ticket, but not for himself, which was a kind of brilliant little symbolic political move that feels memorable and moving even all these years later, because he's basically saying, that's a conflict of interest for me to vote for myself. Or maybe the way you put it, it would be immodest, not very humble to vote for myself. Hmm. But I'm going to vote for my fellow Republicans. Uh, so he didn't cast a ballot for himself, but he seems to have won Illinois without his own vote. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Not by one vote. Not by the one. The other side didn't ask for one more vote. That would vote. be awkward if he lost by one vote after yeah. failing to vote for exactly himself. Exactly, it. I see that uh, maybe a friend of yours, Bill Gorski, says, welcome, Steve, you are a thank gifted you. author. Oh, thank you. And we have many others from Denver uh, and Arlington Heights, Washington, D.C. Awesome. Apache Junction, Arizona. Oh, I love it. Gurney, Illinois. Thank you all for watching. Some of you are always here. Most of you are, in fact. We appreciate that. Um, he, you know, he didn't speak much after he was uh, elected. Yeah. He wanted to stay away from giving. He had to do that on the train, the electoral, uh, to the inauguration. He had to go yeah. off and speak a lot. Yeah. But he didn't want to do that much. He said it was a sign of weakness. Yeah. How was that a sign of weakness to him? Oh, well, let's think about that for a minute. The thing that he did not want to talk about necessarily was his plans after his inauguration. He didn't even want to, until his inauguration, repeat the basic stance on slavery and his party platform because he felt that if he was trying to offer those kinds of reassurances, it would admit that he was afraid of those people who in that time were... Um, were threatening the dissolution of the Union. Uh, he was also following the customs of the time. It's kind of fascinating to think about the fact that if you were running for city council or state legislature, you'd give speeches. And if you're running for Senate, you might give hours long speeches. But if you're running for president, the norm, not universally followed, but normally followed, was to shut up. 
and you should not be seeking the highest office in the land. The office should seek you. The people should decide who they want. You shouldn't be out there arguing for it. And Lincoln followed that custom and shut up. Now, presidential candidates then would still find ways to, like, write a letter to a friend that would happen to get leaked to the media. I mean, they would have ways they would get Lincoln messages out. Yeah, he did that. But in the case of the crisis over secession, he didn't want to talk. He didn't want to offer even reassurance to people because he felt it would just play into the hands of what he called bad men. And that was a controversial decision, but also a classic example of what we were saying about before. When you're thinking about Lincoln, you need to think about what he says because he's such an eloquent speaker, but also think about what he leaves unsaid. That is often just as important. Um, and I wonder if he thought that repetition mm -hmm. Today, we, our politicians over and over bang us on the head with yeah. what they're thinking, which is maybe a good thing. I don't know. Yeah. But maybe he felt that, that everything I've said, I've said. Yes. Everything I could oh. say, I've said. Yeah. The platform is there. And maybe he felt it was a weakness to repeat everything all the time. Yeah. I've said it. You don't need any more. I think that there's probably something to that. And he also, I think, was keen, in a sense, not to make news. Mm -hmm. um, which is a thing that happens today, like a politician repeats a statement a hundred times, but one time they leave a comma out, or they say the instead of a uh, or something, and then there's suddenly news like, did he change his position? Did he modify his position? He wasn't going to do that. One of my favorite examples doesn't have to do with slavery exactly, it, but it has to do with the 1860 campaign. He was questioned about his views on tariff policy which did matter to a lot of Republican voters and industrialists and so forth. And rather than send some new paper that would lay out his position, he arranged for Simon Cameron, who was a political ally of his from Pennsylvania, to receive a letter he had written, I think, 13 years before, or 11 years before, a number of years before, in any case, so that he could see what Lincoln had written once upon a time, but there wouldn't be a single word that would be new or different that would be usable to claim that Lincoln had changed his position or, uh, or like, bent his position to get political gain, because you're not supposed to do that. The presidency is supposed to be more dignified than that. It was uh, Ulysses S. Grant as nominee. Mm -hmm. He was the first one to go out on the Huskings. Oh, really? Yeah. Uh, so he decided that that's where th things broke uh -huh. after that. Um, I'd like to get into a few subjects briefly, sure. quickly, in, out, so people get to understand what's in the book yeah. and what you have to say about it. Thank you. There, uh, the under sovereign is Lean Bear. Yeah. And he was uh, part of a Comanche, Cheyenne, uh, and I think a couple of other tribes Arapaho, that came to like, the yeah. East Room. And you have a photograph of that in your book. And some think that in the upper right hand corner is Mary Lincoln, but we don't think so. That, that's not Mary. But there he is sitting on the ground, maybe the second from the left. Mm -hmm. We have a, oh. a, a wonderful print. That was I produced in this. France for the wow. same thing. You can see Lincoln is small compared to the Indians. The French were very interested in natives here in America, and that's with whom they were interested in here. It was interesting, the speech he gave there, he didn't write it down, he gave it, and a newspaper man was there. Yeah. And uh, he said a couple of things that were kind of interesting. One, that we whites are prosperous because we've settled down. Mm -hmm. as if the Indian cared to be prosperous. Mm -hmm. uh, and the other was that he said that even though we are engaged in a civil war, we, your white brothers are less warlike than your red yeah. brothers. Yeah. Oh, he probably forgot the Crusades and the Hundred Years' War and the Thirty Years' War, and you know, I don't have enough toes and, and, uh, and fingers, fingers yeah. to go on for that. So yeah. what... I, was he really lean bear a sovereign? He didn't really represent all the Cheyenne. And uh, what did we learn in that chapter about Lincoln and a sovereign okay. nation? Well, the reason that I use the word sovereign is because the native nations or Indian nations uh, of the United States, according to a Supreme Court ruling in 1832, in fact, were sovereign over whatever territory they had until such time as they gave up land by selling it or by signing a treaty 
or losing a war. Um, and that was the finding of the Supreme Court. And so if we have the Cheyenne Nation in what is now Colorado, you have effectively an independent nation, even though from a certain point from, the eight, from 1803 onward, people were drawing maps that presumed that that part of the world was part of the United States, but it legally wasn't yet. In 1851, there was a treaty that affirmed the boundaries of the Cheyenne land, and then gold was discovered in some of that land, and white settlers decided that they wanted it. So that's why I refer to him as sovereign. He was part of a collection of people who were separate and apart from the United States, mm. even as they were dominated by the United States. He did join this delegation to come to the White House and speak with the president, and it's really tragic. The Native leaders were invited to help avert a war. There was great fear of a war that Lincoln did not want because he wanted to focus on the Civil War. And so they called in these Indian leaders and appealed to them for peace. But Lincoln had appealed to the wrong people. Yep. The guys who agreed to come were already for peace. That's why they had come. The people he needed to deal with on the question of war was white settlers who were soon to commit some of the worst massacres and the most notorious massacres in the history of Western settlement against the Cheyenne. Yeah, very true. Um, I've come to a moment where differ we must. And uh -oh. I, so I'd like to uh, have a little conversation, just you like bet. Lincoln and sure. his opponents would. Yeah. I'll take you as being Lincoln, and I'll, I'll be I get opponent. to be Lincoln. That's you great. Might. Why okay. not? I, you're my guest and host. Thank you. I'm Thank the host. You. So. Thank you. Um, you write that Lincoln rarely wrote people off. Certainly he didn't write those that he needed off. But there are a host of his friends and allies from, especially earlier on in Illinois, that he he went away from mm -hmm. and did not help. And they thought they were left behind, maybe even used. And I think of Orville Browning, mm -hmm. who didn't get a post he wanted. Norman Judd, who helped him at the wigwam here in Chicago, didn't get the recognition or political job he wanted. He was sent off to Prussia. Bowling Green, Jesse Du Bois, Lyman Trumbull, Leonard Sweat, John Todd Stewart, his old law partner, all of them could have felt disgruntled with Lincoln for not giving them something that he wanted. They probably felt that he wrote them off. Um, I think you make a fair point and a really interesting one. I am thinking as you're speaking of David Herbert Donald, the great Lincoln scholar that mm -hmm. I bet has been through this store or was through this store yes, during does. his lifetime, who wrote a book called We Are Lincoln Men which is about Lincoln's friends. And he makes this very same point that you make, that there were a number of people who thought they were friends of Lincoln but weren't sure that he was their friend. Um, he would accept help and not always remember people afterward. And the idea that he used people, I think there's a reasonable argument uh, for that, that he forgot people, that he left them behind, that he didn't need them anymore. I guess when I say he rarely wrote people off, I meant it in a different sense of saying, this person is hopeless. There's nothing uh -huh. I can get out of this person. That's fair enough. Um, if he did see a way to make use of someone, he would go for it. Near the end of the book is Joseph Campbell. If you were going to write somebody off as a union man, Joseph Campbell would be the guy. He'd been a United States Supreme Court justice who felt that secession was wrong and needless, and yet ended up joining it, resigning from the Supreme Court, going south, and becoming the Assistant Secretary of War in the Confederate government. That's somebody you would write off. But at the very end of the war, when Richmond fell and Lincoln was present, he had a meeting with Campbell, and they discussed whether there was some way to in Campbell's view, set back up the Virginia government, and in Lincoln's view, get the Virginia legislature to order General Lee to surrender. He thought he saw a use for Joseph Campbell and dealt with him. Um, he didn't say, this person is hopeless, I refuse to meet him. There's something else with David Donald that I actually wrote about here, on that um, events controlled me is what Lincoln said. Yes. Donald takes that and swallows it and believes exactly what that is. Mm -hmm. There's controversy on that. I think it depends on which syllable you're ah, emphasizing. Go on. That um, 
certainly circumstances came up, but some of those circumstances were because of what Lincoln had done prior to it. And certainly he was ready to deal with that circumstance and make sure something happened later on. So I'm not sure it's their circumstances are controlling him as much as they come up, and I have many different routes I can take. I'm going to take this one. Yeah. That makes other circumstances. So I don't think is that they just controlled him. He could decide which route he wanted to take and come down to a decision. I'm, I'm with you. I mean, I think a little cognitive dissonance is necessary. He had strange, maybe to some of us, beliefs that he expressed in various ways through his life about the idea that some force larger than ourselves is controlling everything. Uh, at one point, he referred to it as the doctrine of necessity, which was this idea that he picked up on that everything that happens in life and in the universe was like predestined from the beginning and determined by some force beyond the mind. There are other occasions where he writes this way and uh, he refers to that force as God. Of course, his religion, uh, his exact faith is one of those mysteries. Um, but he, he had this sense of destiny. Not that he was a man of destiny, but that things were moving in their courses and were very hard to change. And yet, he clearly had some cognitive dissonance that he could deal with there because he tried to change them. And he did act in certain ways. You're exactly right that he talked about the Emancipation Proclamation, his single greatest achievement, as something that came about because it was necessity and somebody had to do it and it just happened to be him and that was the moment to do it. And yet we know very well that he struggled enormously internally about exactly what to do, exactly when to do it, and even whether to do it. And he's the person who made the choice and that was a big deal. And that then made something else happen later on. Yes. We are really out of our time. You have to go out now and meet your public. There will be okay. some coming in and oh, sign a whole bunch of books. But there's something I want to ask you just very briefly at the end. Please. And that is, do you conceive of this as a national self-help book? Do you think that uh, this is, should be in the self-help section? That's politicians can go over there. We who vote can go over there and help us decide how we're going to meet our fellow citizens and uh, use Lincoln as a model, even though it's a bit different today. It, it is a bit different today, but the answer is yes. I would love it if people thought of it that way. Uh, my, uh, my friend and, and, and writer, fellow writer, Anand Giridharas, described this as a kind of intervention. Um, an effort to kind of get people to reset the way that they approach politics. Uh, I have a friend who has read this book and said the title kept coming into her head when she was having an argument within her family about how to dispose of a piece of property. Um, there is uh, a another friend who had a marriage in the family to a politically different family and thought immediately of this book. I would like to think it's not like direct lessons. You know, do exactly as Lincoln did. Wear a hat like Lincoln wore and everything will be fine. But I would like to think that when we consider the way that Lincoln thought about people, consider the way that Lincoln dealt with people and approached people, it will provoke thoughts for how we can empathize with someone else for how we can set realistic goals for what we can get out of that relationship and how perhaps we can help to make a better country. Well, it's probably better in Yiddish, but your mouth to God's ears. All right. Thank you. Well, let me talk very briefly about upcoming interviews we have on A House Divided. Ron White Jr. is our next one. Here He's again oh, he's here great. after the third, fourth time. On Great Fields, the Unlikely Heroism of Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain. We're due for a uh, birth to death work on him, and this is a spectacular book. I've already begun reading it. Tuesday, October 31st, only three weeks from now, uh, at 3.30 p.m. Central, and you'll see that on our website if you want to go and make sure that you're going to be here for that. You leave your email when you're there so you won't miss it. So that's October 31st with Ron White. On Tuesday, November 21st, is Dr. Elizabeth Varon with Longstreet, the Confederate general who defied the South. Hmm. Fascinating book, especially on Longstreet's post-war life. And that's not something that's been delved in before, and I think you're going to enjoy Elizabeth's work on that. That's November 21st. I hope you'll all come to A House Divided. Well, Steve, 
We're so happy that you are here with your new book, and that is Differ We Must, How Lincoln Succeeded in Divided America. And it's $30, and we have first edition signed. This is our first time to have that since the pandemic, and we appreciate your being here for, for this event. So thank you all for coming and watching A House Divided. We will see you very soon, just in three weeks again. Thank you.